can always cast yourself as the hero of your own story. I was like, Mom, I'm going to be okay. I promise you I'm going to be okay. And then, like, two months later, there was the writer's strike and I was unemployed. <laughs> Wait, what did you do? I always, like, have a little nest egg of, okay, well, if it all goes to Is it as fun as it looks? It's a mixed bag. What made you decide to do Reminiscence? We are the stories we tell of ourselves. Fast forward 20 years from now, you and I are going to get together for coffee. Where are we going to get together? A, that sounds so fun. B, does it have to be coffee? Because I would like to play a board game. Put up your board game. I actually had children in part because it requires three players. <laughs> Hey family, bienvenido. Welcome to another fantastic episode of The Carlos Watson Show. Today we're going to introduce you to a woman who's quickly establishing herself as one of the best writers, directors, and creators in all of Hollywood. Lisa Joy is perhaps best known for co-creating the acclaimed HBO series Westworld with her husband Jonathan Nolan. Prior to that, she wrote for Pushing Daisies and Burn Notice, and now she's written and directed a new sci-fi thriller starring Hugh Jackman. It's called Reminiscence. It's all kinds of fire. You're going to love it. For more, Here's my time with Lisa Joy. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey, Lisa. Hey, how are you? Good. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I know how to take out my gum. Don't put it in. I get in trouble. How are you doing? I am good. Now, I always love gum, and I never take just one at a time. Gum and donut holes are things you shouldn't have only one of. You should have many. I literally just removed the plate of donut holes that I had on this table. Oh, That's my thing. I'm from Jersey. Yes. Dunkin' Donuts was my, my hang. It was like the place to go to be an artist. <laughs> you bring your journal, you get a coffee, you get some donut holes, and you write your like forlorn poems about why Julie doesn't have a crush on you. And then you drive your old Toyota Tercel hatchback back home and cry a little bit. High school is a strange time. I don't know if you've had friends who've posted photos of all of you guys from back in the day, and you were like, <sighs> Why was I allowed to go out like that? <laughs> like oh, that? That shouldn't have happened. I got like a, a Mariah Carey perm. Oh, nice. When I wanted it to be like spiral curls. Right. And it just ended up like crazy poodle zigzags, <laughs> right, you know? Right, and right. I had bangs, so it kind of created this like isosceles triangle. <laughs> Those are the most fun pictures. <laughs> they are so not good. Now, where in Jersey were you? South Orange, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, Parsippany, which is kind of central. Sure. And then uh, near Morristown in Chester, which is like very like white people playing lacrosse, you know? <laughs> you gotta diversify, you gotta do something else. And it's not like I hate lacrosse, it's just that it can't be the main mm. cultural hub yeah. of a high school, because yeah. something's wrong. <laughs> Now, you know, the irony is that the greatest lacrosse player of all time is a black former football player. Really? There's a guy named Jim Brown. As good as he was at football, anyone who knows lacrosse will tell you he's considered the GOAT, the greatest of all time, when it comes to lacrosse. Hey, maybe we can make lacrosse cool. You know, that's so funny you say that. If he were around nowadays, he would have been like the Tiger Woods of lacrosse. And Tiger Woods made golf cool. He definitely did. Like 100%, I went to school with him and he was like the coolest guy ever because he played golf, which was so weird. You guys had Tiger there and you had Chelsea yeah. Clinton there. We did, we did, and Fred Savage. Don't discount Fred. They were all there, yeah. I knew none of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. I would maybe see them in passing at a party, but I would have been too scared to say anything to them. Oh, Reese Witherspoon was there too. Reese Witherspoon went to Stanford? For, I think, a year, and then she left. Do you, do you know um, Sterling K. Brown? He and his wife were there. See, I was in the enchanted broccoli forest at that time. <laughs> at this crazy co-op at Stanford <laughs> that had like quite a reputation, as you yeah. might imagine, a place yeah. called the enchanted right. broccoli yeah. forest yeah. might have. Yeah. My draw group was very like alternative, shall we say. But when you are staying in the enchanted broccoli forest, you don't get that much cross-pollination <laughs> with people in like fraternities <laughs> or right. living less mm -hmm. enchanted broccoli forest mm -hmm. kind of kind of mm -hmm. lives. But I was mm -hmm. also like pretty quiet, so. Did you have good friends there? Yeah, I tend to like hunker down. You know, I have like a small group of friends. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm like scared of everyone else, you know? So <laughs> that's that's my that's my MO. And then when I went to law school, <sighs> I had literally two friends. <laughs> We're still really good friends. One of them writes on Westworld now. And one of them won Survivor with her brother. <laughs> Whoa. 
How weird is that? That is interesting. All of these folks who are going through Harvard Law School these days who aren't practicing law. Like, are they a practicing lawyer who does Survivor on the side? She did it on the side. Yeah. I mean, they're normal people. She's not like just doing the reality show circuit. You have a good name, because I love names. Do you know whether or not it's been especially good to you? People always think it's my first name. Yeah. And then I become Lisa Joy, like that's my Madonna name, but I have no last name. <laughs> and then the other thing is, everybody thinks that Joy is Chinese, right? Because, I think because of the Joy Luck Club. <laughs> because then I'm like, Joy is an English word, <laughs> guys. <laughs> It means like happiness. It's it's English, and they're like, oh, we thought that was your Chinese name from your Chinese father. And I was like, my father is the white one. <laughs> my mom is the Asian one. <laughs> but yeah, no, my actual Chinese name is my middle name, and that's Zhou Zhuqing because it's a transliteration of Joy as as Zhou. What does your mom call you? She calls me uh, Zhuqing if that's uh, that, that's like my first name, or else she'll just call me my my English name. Now, what did you do with your kids? Did you get did you give them any uh, any auspicious names? They both have Chinese names yeah. in their middle name. I don't know how I have blonde children. Like <laughs> something about the like biology Punnett square or whatever yeah. that is, like right. went totally crazy with me because I feel like I should have dominant genes. But they're blonde children who speak fluent Chinese, so it's really funny. It cracks me up. Now, has anybody ever seen you together with your kids and thought, hey, something's off? Oh, I totally look like the nanny. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. Did you practice law at all or no? I did a lot of um, internships that actually I did a lot of work in. So I worked on this case that was um, a woman who had killed her husband after he repeatedly abused her, right? So in, in self-defense and you know, um, battered woman syndrome would be the defense. For me, it was like a passion. I work best when I'm like driven by, you know, something I care passionately about. And I cared about that. And then later on, I worked at the DA's office in family violence on the other side, prosecuting. And then I did a little bit of work for the appellate level lawyers for criminal defense. Oh, but you went almost right away into, into Hollywood. Yeah, so while I was studying for the bar, I freaked out um, and also wrote my first TV spec because I didn't know how to be a writer or make a living as a writer. I mean, it sounds preposterous because I've always loved writing and idolized writers so much that it's like, why would I ever be allowed to become one? And I wrote this script and applied to be a writer's assistant for my friend, Michael Green, who's this lovely writer. They asked me for an interview and I interviewed and then I, I went away and I went to Silicon Valley and I started working in this room with this big <clears throat> search engine company. And I'm in the middle of giving a meeting and my cell phone starts ringing and I step out and it's my agents who I hadn't had the day before. I'd actually called up these guys and said, is there special stationery or anything that you have for when somebody submits a script? Because my husband was at that agency and you know I didn't want to ask them to represent me, but I wanted my script to look like it might be official. And they seemed just as surprised as I was. They were like, you have an offer to join the writer's room of the show. And I was like, are you my agents now? And they were like, I guess. <laughs> And so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna do that. I need like a month to wind down this study. And my, my, that day's agents were like, what are you talking about? They're like, the writer's room starts tomorrow. Like, you gotta go there. They're not gonna wait for you for a month. That's not how TV works. And I was like, what? So I had to quit on the spot. And I'm like a very responsible person. So this was incredibly traumatic for me. And I called my mom and she cried, not out of happiness. <laughs> She was like, what are you doing? How are you gonna pay the rent? And I understood her tears. She was like, can't you just do it at night and just send them the scripts at night? And I was like, I think they want me to sit in this room with them and break these episodes. I don't know any of this, but we'll figure it out. And I was like, mom, I'm gonna be okay. I promise you I'm gonna be okay. And then like two months later, there was the writer's strike and I was unemployed. <laughs> Wait, what did you do when the writer's strike started? Were you freaked out? I was just kind of like, 
Of course, there's a writer's frame. <laughs> I, like, I mean, I never expected to get this far as a writer. I got to be in a writer's room. I got to write an episode and now there's a writer's strike and I'm going to have to come up with a completely different life plan. Thank God I've been keeping up my bar membership. You know, I can still hang a shingle and like, you know, represent people in divorce court or whatever. So I had some backup plans, mostly involving law. And I still do, you know, you never know when the tide will turn. I always like have a little nest egg of, okay, well, if it all goes to you, you know, I'll be Lisa Joy Esquire. <laughs> I love that you have good energy about it because I do think that one of the gifts in life is actually being able to enjoy it in the moment. Is it as fun as it looks? It's a mixed bag, right? This is a really scary industry. You never know how something's gonna go. And for me personally, the thing that I love is making stuff with people that I love. I, right. I absolutely adore that. Like how often in life does that happen? You know, where people from all walks of life come together and are like, Let's make something. Let's deny the entropic pull of the universe and make something that will maybe entertain someone. That's amazing. The process of that is amazing. Everything else is terrifying. <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> it's so scary. Right. It's so hard. Yeah. I've taken so many knocks. Hey, Lisa, from the outside looking in, you've had one of the best careers out there, but I assume it wasn't always easy. Can you take us inside and tell us a little bit about some of the challenges in dreaming fearlessly? People always have trouble trying to find out who they are and everything. And when you think you know who you are, but the world keeps telling you all these other things and you have to just to make room to like walk in your own air, combat all that. It's really hard. I, I went to this thing for the Asian society and this like lovely young lady came up and was like, I want to be just like you. And I was like, you can be way better than me. And that's that's the great thing. If that's your passion, then don't be scared and don't look too much around you. Just follow it and, and be ready to dust yourself off and keep walking, you know, and, and hold hands with people who are good people, because otherwise you're not going to make it. When the waters began to rise, and war broke out. Nostalgia became a way of life. There wasn't a lot to look forward to. So people began looking back. Nothing is more addictive than the past. No, 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 put me back, put me back. What made you decide to do Reminiscence? It started a long, long time ago, because I've always, I've ha I have what I, I think is a terrible memory, you know, and it always upsets me, because I'm like, what have I forgotten? And my husband makes fun of me for it, but because of that, I've always been enthralled by memory, right? And, and sometimes I can't tell if I actually have a terrible memory or if I just have such high expectations for memory that I'm always questioning my own memories and whether I've put some kind of subjective spin on it. We are the stories we tell of ourselves. Like that's who we become. Like we're all storytellers, right? Yeah, and yeah. the problem is if we're all storytellers, that's where a lot of like truly behavior can result, right? Because you can always cast yourself as the hero of your own story. You can always cast yourself as a martyr, as a victim. So I've always been obsessed with that angle of, you know, personal narrative. And at the time, you know, I was pregnant I just left my job and I was unemployed for a reason. And I haven't, I, you know, I, I don't talk about this much. And I, I actually haven't spoken about this until now because it's it's not particularly a, a, a co commercial thought, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, all those sweet ideas of memory were definitely a part of me because I'm deeply idealistic and emotional. But I was also at the time incredibly, incredibly hurt because I'd been on a staff where I was the only girl for, for years and there was really bad behavior. There was a cookbook in the middle of the table on how to make recipes out of semen, you know? And like the jokes and the constant talking about, you know, violent sex things. And to be honest, that's not even what bothered me. It truly, in the end, cause it was so obvious. I'm like, that's sexual harassment. I can identify that and be like, you know, I'm not gonna deal with that. I'm just gonna ignore it, you know? The thing that was far more insidious was I work in an industry where there's no answer book in the back of what you're writing that says, you've done something good or you've done something bad. 
You can only write and work as truly as you can. But in a room like that, everything that I wrote, I would literally get my scripts crumpled up and handed back to me. I had to quit and I quit because I was like, I don't think I can have the kind of way I want to see the world anymore if I stay in this environment. You know, like I think it's going to make me a really dark person, you know, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be a dark person. It's no way to live. Beautiful things happen then. I think I got less stressed out and managed to get pregnant and that was wonderful. Yeah. And in that moment, you know, as somebody who's been guided my whole life by how can I take care of myself financially and, and having real pressures, I couldn't get hired. I was pregnant and unemployed. And so I had nothing to do but write for myself. You know, and for the first time I got to write whatever the hell I felt like. And the thing that I wrote was was reminiscence. That machine of yours, how close can you get before the illusion's broken? As I talked to Hugh, I was like, it's so important for me that you sign on to this because you're a big movie star and you're a great action star and they're gonna look at it and see that. Like, I want this film to be an indictment of the male gaze. <laughs> it's not a love story. Like, I wanted to show a man who is not a bad man. He's a good man. He's a man that I could easily love, but he's flawed. The hero of the story isn't always perfect. And he falls in love the way so many people are supposed to fall in love in movies. Things that have what I call jagged edges that aren't perfectly polished to the very end, to a predictable end, I think are richer and more enjoyable. You know, Hugh has been on this journey with me. It is a huge thing for an actor mm, yeah. like Hugh, you know, mm. a big movie star to be like, I've never directed a film, you know, you're bringing me this original. <laughs> that's, that's a mix of things that aren't really made nowadays. I was like, you're gonna have to be ugly and foolish sometimes. And it's because love and lust can blind you. It's about that kind of blindness and learning to see. And, and the idea of that, he could understand the romance of that. He literally was like, I have no vanity about this. I'm not doing it for the money. I'm in with you, whatever it takes. What does your mom say? I'm, I'm guessing she must be pretty proud. You know, the great thing about my mom is I think, you know, my movie just premiered mm -hmm. and all this stuff just happened. I haven't heard anything from, from them. <laughs> they just ignored it. And and that's not for lack of love. That's just because like, it's, Ho it's Hollywood. Like people's got real problems. And, and sometimes like, I'm like, how could they not? But then I'm like, because they don't care. And I shouldn't care either. When people look back on their happy times, they are not fancy times. They are not even very unique times. They are simply company, the idea of being intimately seen, the feeling of beauty. Most beautiful place you've ever been to? Portofino. Oh, very nice. It's so beautiful. The nature, the way the buildings are built into, it's like, it's really, it's really pleasant. <laughs> are, are you an Airbnb person? Are you a hotel person? What do you do? Airbnb. All nice hotels are the same. All Airbnbs are different. You can live like a local. I Airbnb it. All right, before I let you go, I have to do rapid fire with you. Yes, let's do it. What's your favorite book? Oh my gosh, what is the, the, the Slaughterhouse Five? Fast forward uh, 20 years from now, you and I are gonna get together for coffee. Where are we gonna get together? Okay, A, that sounds so fun. Um, <laughs> B, does it have to be coffee because that is, <laughs> Can it just be like a nice like cocktail or mocktail? Yes. I would like to play a board game. Oh. If possible. Put put up your board game. So I'd like to play this game Settlers of Catan. <laughs> I actually had yeah. children in part because it requires three players. And so yeah. I needed the extra one. And I taught my daughter how to play. It's a very complicated game. I love it. I love it. Uh, Lisa Joy, I'm coming to see you for uh, for that joyful cocktail. Well, you got to start training on Settlers for Catan. There's an app. You know, you can play remotely with my daughter and I. We will kick your ass because we've been training a long time now. <laughs> I am very tricky. What you don't know is that I'm going to win your daughter over. She's going to be on my team and therefore we're going to beat you. Yeah, we'll see who is Lord of Catan. That's, that's what you get to be if you win. We, we shall see. All right, Lisa, be safe. I will bone up on the app and come see you. Amazing, amazing. It has been such a pleasure talking to you. Same, same, same. Be well. 
Here we go, Lisa Joy, Creek Talks. Take one, marker. I love turds. So I'm assembling my Algonquin table nice. um, of besties yes. from the Carlos Watson show. Mm-hmm. And Lisa Joy will be, I don't know if, she, if she's to my right or to my left, but <laughs> she's uh, she's at that table. She's close to me. Gabrielle Union's there. Yes. Gloria Steinem's there. David is there. I, You know, it is a great table. That is a great table. Yeah, yeah. Yes. There's something about her energy, her ease and her body and her smile and the way she talked about the people that she surrounds herself with. I just really loved the interview. It was I knew nothing about her, and I am now a huge fan. I thought it was really cool to see somebody, a female with that much confidence and stuff, but I really wanted to get her and Reggie Watts together because they had that same energy. Oh, 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 that is actually an interesting thing if we start asking who has either similar energies or similar laughs or similer senses of humor. It was humor. just like the, the, the oh, yin so and yang of that energy happening to me. That's oh. just what I saw. I really liked what she was like talking about. One thing that I noticed was that she likes to talk about other people more than what she likes to like talk about herself. I really admire that. Hey, really hope you enjoyed Lisa Joy. What a talent, what an interesting person. Uh, Loved her whole story. Loved her walking away from Silicon Valley and following her passion in Hollywood. Loved her friendship set. Uh, Loved just the easy way about her and loved the big ideas that she's bringing into the world and the fact that she doesn't need them to all kind of fit perfectly together. I like that, I like that. Listen, thanks all of you for tuning into the Carlos Watson Show. Appreciate you each and every time. Be safe, be well. We'll see you on the other side. Mm -hmm.